Haberman, and I'm at uh, the University of uh, Florida in uh, Gainesville. Um, I'm part of the division of uh, otology and neurotology. So what I wanted to talk about this morning uh, was clusteotoma, but um, I wanted to actually center on, a, on, a, on the acquired clusteotomas, um, and in particular, primary acquired clusteotoma and secondary acquired clustitoma. And we'll talk about that. Now, there's, there are some uh, definitional things that we'll go through in a, in a minute. But um, when you think about clustitoma, um, this is probably I'll review for you, but it's a collection of keratinized squamous epithelium in the ear. That be, could be a primary lesion or a secondary lesion. Uh, it has a couple of key characteristics where it's locally invasive and uh, locally destructive. There's a lot of re, there's a lot of definitions about well what is or what isn't clusteotoma. Uh, for example, is a retraction pocket clusteotoma is atelectasis or atrophy of the eardrum is that clusteotoma? But there seems to be some some very common characteristics uh, that define clusteotoma. One of those is sputum erosion, uh, which is a, a we'll get into a little bit later. And with otomicroscopy, we're really able to get very good looks at the eardrum and surrounding structures and make better characteristics or better definitions of what we're seeing. So I wanna make sure that we are clear about uh, nomenclature. So primary clustitoma or synonymous would be congenital clustitoma. We don't really use the word primary clustitoma much we, most of us will use the word congenital clostitoma to describe that, which is the characteristic anterior superior uh, middle ear finding of a, of a clostitoma pearl. Um, but that's what, this talk is not about that necessarily. This is about acquired clostitoma. And then specifically primary acquired clostitoma and secondary acquired clostitoma. So the incidence of clostitoma is, is uh, four to six per 100,000, um, more, more men, people of lower so socioeconomic status perhaps, and then underdeveloped countries. So those who see large numbers of um, uh, immigrant population, for example, you might see more clostitomas. In my career, I've had uh, the opportunity to serve and treat uh, different uh, immigration or people that came in through um, Southeast Asia, and then Latin America, and then East Africa and West Africa. Uh, so over my career, I've seen a significant number of, of clustitomas associated with different parts of the world and um, coming into uh, uh, the clinic. I spent most of my career at, at, in Minnesota where I saw uh, the vast majority of those patients. So uh, now I'm at the University of Florida and we, we also now see uh, a, a broad array of uh, uh, people coming from uh, not only from Florida, but the Southeast and also from uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. So this slide goes through uh, current theories of clusteotoma formation. So there's, there's four kind of theories out there and uh, there's um, retraction pocket, squamous metaplasia, squamous immigration, and then basal cell hyperplasia. Um, but all of these theories will, will make sense to you. It's, it, if you if you go through them one by one, they'll they'll, they'll tend to start making sense about which is uh, makes uh, more likely, which is less likely. But this is just what's out there and reported. Uh, usually, the pars flaccid area for uh, acquired clostitoma is where we see this, but but not always. So let's let's go through the different theories. Uh, you can see on the on the pictures on the right hand of the screen of the screen where it uh, uh, the various theories are presented and in uh, in picture form. Um, but retraction pocket is, of course, what we most commonly think leads to clustitoma, where you have this chronic negative middle ear uh, pressure from the eustachian tube dysfunction, and then uh, you form retraction pockets in the pars tensa part of the eardrum. Uh, associated with uh, sputum erosion and a pocket formation. So over time, it'll close off and it, uh, desquamated keratin debris will then uh, fill in this cyst 
and then you have cholestitoma. So when we think about the most common kind of primary acquired cholestitoma, which is what we're talking about here, uh, this theory seems to be the most widely accepted. When you think about what you see in the clinic when people come in with cholestitomas, uh, you can see these areas of sputum erosion uh, posteriorly, superiorly, and then you would think, oh yeah, definitely this is, this is from this chronic uh, negative pressure uh, building up and causing this condition. The squamous metaplasia theory is with um, transforming, transformation of middle mucosa into keratinizing epithelium. So this has been described and discussed and talked about at length, but has really not been um, proven. So I think that the biggest problem is that cholesterol is ectodermal, so, which is different than mucosa. So we would think that that's probably not as likely as a, a theory. Uh, squamous immigration theory, where the, uh, the eardrum basically migrates through a, some sort of portal or perforation to enter the middle ear cavity. So when we get into the definition of a secondary acquired cholecytoma, I'll kind of come back to this because um, this is um, really more of a definition of secondary acquired than primary acquired. But there has been uh, reports in the literature that uh, that you might have this sort of immigration of squamous epithelium uh, uh, being the source of a primary acquired cholecytoma. Um, the last bullet point was um, where the uh, majority of cholecytomas occur with intact eardrum. I'll, I'll discuss that when, with a photograph in a second. But I don't mean an, an entirely intact eardrum, but if you look at most of the eardrum uh, itself, will be intact uh, with prim primary acquired cholecytoma. Uh, then finally, basal cell hyperplasia, where these uh, keratin-filled microcysts or pseudopods uh, invade then the subepithelial tissue of the prosaic space. So there, there may be some histologic specimens that support this, um, but uh, again, I wanted to present what's been reported in the literature so you can have that for your reference. So secondary acquired cholestitoma is... Um, epithelial migration into the ear through usually a perforated eardrum. And it's so you can think of secondary acquired cholecytoma as basically secondary to some event. So something happened and then secondarily formed cholecytoma. So uh, infection trauma and iatrogenesis, uh, for example, like an ear tube uh, insertion or something like that. Um, there is, uh, these are often associated with chronic inflammation. Um, and then there's proliferation of epidermis in the middle ear. Um, so if you think back of that squamous metaplasia theory we talked about earlier, it could be that actually secondary acquired, secondary acquired cholecytoma is, uh, uh, forms as a result of metaplasia, although I can't say that I have ab uh, absolute proof of that. So, but in, uh, in essence, you have primary acquired cholecytoma, uh, mostly thought to be due to uh, chronic negative middle ear pressure. And then you have secondary acquired cholecytoma as a result of some previous event. So that's how we kind of char characterize uh, uh, acquired cholecytomas. In the clinic, I try to differentiate these. So when I see primary acquired versus secondary acquired, then um, I would utilize that terminology in terms of my uh, documentation. So there's, very, there's pretty characteristic uh, symptoms, uh, clinical features of cholestitomas, uh, which are uh, fairly uh, expected. Um, uh, some people present with nonspecific orologic symptoms, but you, you would expect to see hearing loss, perhaps tinnitus. But one of the main ones, the thing that is uh, characteristic of cholestitoma would be foul, foul, foul smelling, purulent odorrhea, that's painless. So um, we have to add that bullet point, painless. But so painless, foul smelling, purulent odorrhea is kind of like your classic kind of presentation of, of a cholestitoma. Of course, you can have other symptoms too, like vertigo and facial nerve uh, palsies um, in uh, advanced cholestitomas, uh, which uh, get a lot more attention, I think, than just 
otorrhea. Um, just the, uh, if you think about the presentation of otorrhea in your clinic, you can think of all kinds of um, uh, differential or things in the differential that you would think about. <clears throat> but um, uh, painless otorrhea in particular seems to be the, the one that is uh, most prominent. So hearing loss, of course, is present with cholesterol and that can be quite interesting in the clinical setting. Uh, when you think about primary acquired cholecytoma, you think, well, this is going to take a while for this to happen. Um, it can uh, erode ossicles. Um, uh, it can even erode into the inner ear through the cochlea or into the cochlea, causing central neuro hearing loss. And then secondary acquired cholecytoma, they probably already have some element of hearing loss anyway. And then when you add the cholecytoma on top, then you're probably going to be saying, well, there is actually a progression or worsening of the hearing loss. But one of the challenges, uh, clinical challenges that we have is with, especially with primary acquired cholecytoma, is that if you have a large cholecytoma that basically has eroded the incus and the stapes superstructure and is, is sitting on the stapes footplate, you can have a situation where you have actually an intact or intact drum over the cholecytoma with superior, posterior superior uh, erosion and actually pretty good hearing. Those, those cases are, are quite challenging because the patient will come in with this uh, history of otorrhea or um, you know, situation with, with uh, the other symptoms of cholecytoma, but then uh, their hearing is pretty good. And they're, you know, they're asking me like, okay, well, what's gonna happen to my hearing when you remove this? So we'll talk about that, about that a little bit later with the surgical approaches to this. But it does present a significant challenge uh, for us in trying to maintain or even improve on hearing results. Let me just see, I'm gonna check something about the um, uh, chat. If, there's any, if, if anybody has any questions, they can send a chat message. I'll try to answer it on, at the time um, <clears throat> or let me know or just uh, speak up. So in terms of the history, we talked a bit about history and uh, review of systems. Now, physical exam uh, is basically otomicroscopy is uh, the gold standard in terms of examination. Um, as we move into this newer world of adding telemedicine, uh, we haven't quite figured out all of that yet. Maybe you guys out there will figure out the best ways to do uh, otoscopy uh, if we do a telemedicine or with telemedicine, but um, when I see a patient uh, in our clinic, our otology clinics, I mean, the first thing I'm gonna do is get a, an outdoor history and uh, review systems. I'm gonna get a really good look uh, with, a, with a microscope at their eardrum. Now, a lot of people use endoscopes as well, which can be absolutely fantastic. Um, we have both capabilities. Um, sometimes I'll use endoscopes, uh, sometimes I'll use microscopes, but most of the time I'll use a microscope and then try to characterize and uh, describe in detail uh, what I'm seeing. Uh, High-resolution high CT scan is very commonly done, but I, I, what I would say to you is that it's not 100% uh, necessary in every single case. Um, if you have a patient that comes into your clinic and they have a very characteristic history, uh, past history of otitis media probably, and then a history of painless otorrhea that's foul smelling, and you look in their ear and they have sputum erosion and you can see uh, obvious uh, cholesteatoma, uh, you might move directly into treatment phase uh, versus doing a high, resolu high resolution CT scan. I would say in the vast, vast majority of my cases, uh, they either have a CT scan done by the time they see me or will order a CT scan. Uh, sometimes the diagnosis is obvious the treatment is obvious and we know what we're gonna do, but we'll do the CT scan pre-op. So we have those situations as well. Uh, to save, some people come from a long ways away, so to save them time, we might uh, order it uh, the day that they're in clinic, uh, or even if the, there's a day before surgery that they're gonna be in the area or even before surgery. So, but um, I, I can think of a few cases at UF where I've, done uh, um, tympanomastoid surgery without CT. And then in my career, I can think of many episodes or many times uh, when I've uh, proceeded without uh, CT scanning. However, I would 
say to you that and when you think about your physical exam and then um, what you're going to order for testing, you're going to do an audiogram and you're going to do a CT scan. That would be sort of the uh, characteristic things you should think about doing. So uh, oto otoscopy or otomicroscopy, um, where you can basically see the, uh, the cholecystoma, where you can see where the lesion is, uh, or you see the retraction pocket. When we think about these definitions of cholecystoma, uh, I've been in conferences where there's been lengthy debates about what is and what isn't a cholecystoma. Uh, I've heard people classify them as a retraction pocket where the depth cannot be determined, where if you took a long, uh, large right angle pick and you place it into the pocket, you're not really able to appreciate the depth of that pocket. I mean, is that a cholecystoma or do you have, have to have the local invasion, local destruction with a cyst to really make that diagnosis. I mean, I've heard this debate for many years um, uh, in terms of, well, this is and this isn't a clustitoma. I like the idea of where you can't really identify the extent of the retraction pocket as a clustitoma. That's typically what I'll think about when I'm examining patients or um, uh, saying it is or isn't versus an adelectatic eardrum or just a retraction pocket. I mean, typically the ear canal is clear, but not always. I mean, you can have situations where you have the drainage and then they have a secondary otitis externa. Uh, in fact, a lot of patients that will come into our clinic or some patients will come into our clinic with a diagnosis of otitis externa <clears throat> when actually what they have is a cholecystoma. So, but when you're looking under the microscope, you can get an idea of the posterior superior quadrant uh, erosion. And of course, they're pearly white um, structures. If you can see the pearly white structure uh, in the posterior superior quadrant and you have everything meeting history-wise, I mean, you basically have a diagnosis. So that's fairly straightforward. Well, this is kind of what I'm talking about. If you look at this photograph on the right, uh, when you think about retraction pocket, so is that a cholecystoma or is, the, is that not a cholecystoma? I mean, if you look at the yellow and the, and the white arrows, I mean, you obviously see a, a fairly large retraction pocket with, pocket with the head of the malleus. You can see the little red dot oval around the neck of the malleus. And so it, look, it's obvious that there's a, a, an erosive process going on. Um, but is that cholecystoma or is, or is it not cholecystoma? Um, I, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that if you reach with an instrument and you really can't appreciate the depth uh, then I would say, yeah, that's cholecystoma. I would agree that that would be cholecystoma. But you have cases that come in with maybe not quite as an, an extensive amount of sputum erosion, uh, where you have some sputum erosion with a retraction pocket that you may say, okay, that's, I'm, I'm really, maybe that's early cholecystoma, but I don't have to do anything right now. So um, that's one of those things clinically you have to make that determination. So uh, high-resolution res, high CT scan is really what we I talked about before is the gold standard. Um, if you look at uh, the excluding cholecystomas with a well-aerated cavity or a mastery cavity, um, is that really give you the predictive value? Uh, sometimes, I would say that that sometimes is true. So if you, uh, you look uh, for example, we'll go back to that picture, that picture there. And then if you have a very well aerated mastoid, no evidence of a mass or no evidence of soft tissue, uh, you would think more along the lines of retraction pocket versus clustitoma. Um, CT scans, though, also help plan your surgical approaches. Uh, you can look at the sigmoid sinus, you can look at the tegmen. You can look at the uh, lateral semicircular canal, the facial nerve. All these things are, are extremely helpful in terms of the extent of the disease and with your planning for a surgical approach. Um, I, I know that you guys are, I think, mainly residents or most all residents, so you've seen plenty of CAT scans. Um, but here's kind of an example of this uh, axial view. And then if you look medial to the head of the malleus, you're kind of seeing some air. And then lateral to the malleus, you see the soft tissue. <clears throat> so to me, when I look at something like this, I think, okay, 
you have a process going on. It's not eroded through the head of the malleus yet, but you have some extension into the mastoid, probably the antrum. Um, it could be clesiotoma, it could be uh, soft tissue, um, mucosal thickening or something like that. But when you, when you look at these scans, what, you're, what I look at him especially, is that if I see these areas of aeration around soft tissue, and if I see sort of a demarcation of the soft tissue from the aeration, I'm thinking, oh, okay, so there, there is a mass there. There is something to be more concerned about. So I would think more cholesteatoma versus uh, inflammatory disease only without cholesteatoma. So um, we're, we'll talk about second stage uh, ear surgery shortly, but uh, diffusion weighted MRI scan has really uh, come along to uh, reduce the likelihood of requiring second stage or second look surgeries. Um, I use it quite frequently now uh, with our patients, even in the most uh, uh, severe cases of uh, initial, uh, or where the cholesterol is very uh, extensive. Um, if I feel as if the surgery went quite well, uh, I offer um, diffusion-weighted MRI scan to look to see if there's evidence of more cholesteatoma. Um, so I, I, I feel that the test is very helpful these days. Uh, this is just a photograph just showing the, where it lights up and you think, okay, there you go. You have, you have more. Um, <clears throat> I have um, uh, a lot of cases where I'm convinced, I'm 100, 100, almost 100% convinced there's going to be a lot more and we do these MRI scans and there isn't. So then I will continue to watch those cases. And then I also have situations where I think, no way, there, it's not, there's not more cholesterol and, and I'm wrong. So there, there is cholesterol. Uh, of course, there's other things too that can happen in the middle ear or mastoid, uh, um, probably without the bony erosion you see in cholesterol. Those are all listed and it's just the kind of thing that you would expect uh, cholesterol granulomas, mucosils, granulation tissue, uh, inflammatory tissue, edema, fibrosis, etc. Uh, <clears throat> and more, including uh, 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 tumors and cancers. Um, so I've, I've seen more benign tumors than I have malignant tumors, although it, uh, a lot of the referrals that we get here um, are malignant, but in the, over the, the, my career in particular, I've seen more benign tumors than, than um, malignant tumors. So when you, if you make your diagnosis then of cholesterol, then uh, what, I, what I've learned and what I still um, say is basically a surgical disease. And um, when I say about controlling acute infections, what, what we're really doing is we're saying, uh, okay, we're going we're gonna to stop your drainage. That's one of, the, one of the goals, we're gonna remove the disease and control your, your drainage. You're not gonna be, uh, you're not gonna have this purulent material coming out of the ear. Um, so number one goal is to remove the disease and number two goal is to restore and maintain hearing. So I have that conversation with patients uh, all the time, which is um, you have a cholesterol. our primary goal is to remove it. Um, it could be that we remove it and your hearing gets worse. Uh, it could be that we remove it and your hearing is a lot better, or it could be the same. But we need to first goal be to remove the disease. And um, most everyone that I treat, or they'll, they, they understand that and they'll accept that. Uh, they've been dealing with, these, uh, with this condition probably for many years. So it's, it's something that... Um, uh, they're not surprised to hear that they have it. Uh, usually <clears throat> when we talk to patients, we'll, start, we'll explain about uh, cholesterol and, the, and the, the response is, yeah, I knew I had something going on. I and mean, that's almost all the time we, we kind of hear that statement. So they're not surprised at all to uh, find that they have something that needs to be taken care of surgically. Uh, also, they're not surprised, they're not uh, uh, surprised to hear that their hearing may be worse or you know could be better or might be the same. So there, a lot of times people will even make statements along the lines of just get rid of the disease. I don't worry about my hearing, which may, may or may not be true really, but um, 
they're used to this condition. They're, they know what it's, what it's about for them. So they're very happy to be able to know that there's a treatment plan. So when we talk about the uh, infection associated with this, it's, it's basically what you would expect in terms of organisms, Pseudomonas, Staph aureus, et cetera. Um, now there's a whole separate talk that uh, we could get into about separative complications of otitis media. Uh, I'm gonna take a minute here to talk about um, the uh, uh, chronic otitis media paradigm. So when we think about chronic otitis media, we, it's basically a continuum of disease. I mean, you go from acute otitis media to where it transitions uh, into more of a chronic state. Um, and in children, of course, we, this is, that's a separate discussion as well. But uh, in the adult population where you have uh, persisting and recurring infections, usually with effusions, mucosal edema, mucosal uh, disease throughout the middle ear and mastoid. Uh, and then um, you have, I like to categorize it, clostitoma or chronic otitis media with clostitoma and chronic otitis media without clostitoma. So they're kind of different animals. The chronic otitis media with clostitoma is what this talk is about and what I've discussed about surgical disease. And then if you take the whole uh, separate segment of chronic otitis media without clostitoma, it's, that's a different thing. So, uh, however, having said all of that, uh, both conditions, chronic otitis media with clostitoma, chronic otitis media without clostitoma, can lead to these separative complications. So meningitis, um, well, acute mastoiditis, meningitis, brain abscesses, epidural abscesses, <clears throat> lateral sinus thrombosis, et cetera. So um, there, there's, the thing to keep in mind is that um, you are, you're probably more likely to develop, and I, I don't have the, uh, I'd have to double check on this, with clostitoma complications uh, versus your chronic otitis media without clostitoma complications. Uh, so getting cultures is, uh, is, uh, is something that I'll do if people come in. A lot of times they've come in with multiple courses of antibiotics. They've been treated with cephalosporins, augmentin, I mean, Cipro, oral Cipro, uh, uh, quinolone, uh, quinolone drops, um, all kinds of different things. So they come in or fun antifungal treatment as well. Uh, sometimes it's really helpful if you have a, uh, like an acute flare-up where you can get a culture and you can identify uh, an organism, uh, you might be able to treat, uh, switch treatment to a more specific or treatment if it's based on cultures. Um, however, um, a lot of times, what, if you're identifying clostitoma, you're gonna be moving to surgery and the cultures may or may not be that helpful. So um, I would base it uh, on what I'm seeing and what the history is, whether or not I'll do a culture. All right, so in the time that's remaining, uh, and, uh, Dr. Comer had mentioned that try to keep this to uh, 30, or 30 to 40 minutes so that we have time for some uh, interaction. Uh, so obviously the, this, this slide has the canal well up and canal well down mastoidectomies. So uh, for decades, I did a, an instructional course at the academy on these, on these techniques, uh, a two, two hour course. Um, and then I didn't do it for a few years. We actually resubmitted it this year. Uh, uh, so we'll see if, if it gets on again. But um, there's, when you think about these approaches, there's canal well up versus canal well down. Historically, uh, canal well down mastoidectomy has been done for clostitoma with very good results. So and it wasn't until into the 60s and 19, 1960s, 1970s, when canal well up mastoidectomy or tympanomastoidectomy was started to be utilized. And then when canal wall up mastoidectomy was utilized, there was a, a lot of debate in the otologic world because it seemed like you can't get clostitoma out by leaving the canal wall up. You need to take the canal wall down to really get it out. Which developed, and then surgical approaches uh, were developed to open the facial recess. And when the facial recess was open, there was another avenue into the middle ear. And if you think about clostitoma, I like to think about three areas where clostitomas can hide. 
the fascia recess, the sinus tympani, and the anterior, temp anterior epitympanum. So with extended canal wall up techniques, uh, opening the fascia recess during the so-called posterior tympanotomy, uh, you have access to one of the areas where cholecystomas might be hiding. By removing the incus and the head of the malleus, then you have a direct line of sight to the anterior epitympanum. And then by taking the um, incus uh, buttress down, then you have more of, even more exposure over the facial nerve. You can't see into the sinus tympani, but you're close to having the same vis visualization as canal wall down tympanomastoidectomy. So these mastoidectomy techniques developed over time, the canal wall up techniques developed over time. Uh, so today where we are is you have these two basic techniques. Now having said all that, there's another, there's many different uh, varieties where you can, uh, uh, you can remove the, the, do an atacotomy, uh, which is kind of like a mini canal wall down, if you will, uh, where you just, go from the inside out, and you follow where the clesitoma goes, and an atacotomy may be all that you have to do with canaloplasty in order to remove the clesitoma. So, but the two broad uh, categories are these two procedures. Um, so again, the canal wall up, what you're trying to do is re maintain the normal anatomy of the ear canal, um, try to uh, uh, the, uh, keep things intact uh, so that you have a better uh, result with the hearing. It's easier to take care of. And um, um, in temporal bone classes that you guys have already had, you've already been doing this. If you're a senior resident, you've been hopefully been doing these procedures. So uh, Canal Wall Up has these pros and these cons, which are uh, reported in the literature. Um, but we've kind of uh, talked about that some already, but not, not exposing the entire middle ear cleft really is talking about the sinus tympani. So when we say technically more difficult, um, it actually is more difficult and is actually more aggressive to be doing canal wall up surgery for cholecystoma than canal wall down surgery. Canal wall down surgery would be considered more, even more conservative and should be less difficult technically than canal wall up. So uh, the canal wall down, if you think about historically, uh, it, it may or may not be the most widely used surgical approach, but over time, if you look at 100 years of otology or longer, it, it probably actually is probably the more widely used approach over the hist history of otology uh, for cholecystoma. Uh, there's a couple of keys about uh, uh, canal wall down surgery um, is that if you have really extensive disease and you're really not able to get the cholecystoma out through a canal wall up approach, there's no problem with converting your canal wall up approach to canal wall down approach. So um, in, in fact, we'll have situations where we say that there's an enormous amount of uh, uh, posterior ear canal uh, erosion necessitating converting it to canal wall down. Uh, Low-hanging tegmin may be another one, anterior sigmoid may be another one. So um, these are just um, uh, different uh, ideas that come up when converting from canal wall up, canal wall down. What, what I like to do is think of it more systematically in terms of when do I convert? Um, and the, the two most common things that I use to convert is the uh, amount of lateral canal uh, destruction from the clostitoma, and also with the an anatomy of the mastoid, if it's not allowing you adequate visualization of the areas you need to get into to remove the clostitoma. So if either of those two are, are not in place, then I'll say we need to convert it, we need to do canal wall down, we need to help the patient that way. Um, th these are some interesting points about uh, surgical experience, for example, a lot of people, they do contemporary bone classes, they do canal wall up surgery in residency, or they're doing fellowships or otologic or neuro neurologic fellowships, they do a lot of canal wall up procedures. But if you think about your canal wall down surgery, you probably need less experience to do a good job with that than you do canal wall up, uh, because you have much more visualization 
Um, the procedure itself may be shorter. Uh, you, you, people think, well, it's going to be longer to do canal wall down, but actually not. It may be shorter to do canal wall down versus canal wall up. Uh, there is the, the cons about the, um, uh, it does take a while to heal. So when you have a mastoid cavity, another thing that's really important is a meatoplasty and removal of a, of a crescent of chondral cartilage to do a meatoplasty. When you do the meatoplasty, then you're going to uh, really uh, make sure that you have a good, good opening into the mastoid cavity. But that having said that, the, um, uh, it does take a while for that to heal. Water exposure limits, uh, interesting point in Florida, we have a lot of people in water. Well, actually nobody's in water right now, but, um, but um, we have scuba divers, we have uh, swimmers, we have people going to the beach, uh, we have the, you know, uh, all these people that want to know, can, well, when can I go back and do what I do? So what we will, uh, we'll, what we'll do with people is with canal wall up surgery, I try to get them back to their normal uh, water exposure. With canal wall down, I think it's a lot harder to do, but I think if somebody has an excellently healed epithelialized cavity, uh, I think that they, they do have the opportunity to try to get back to some water exposure. Um, I have a bunch of patients here in Florida that are scuba divers, and we and with stapes surgery and also with canal wall up surgery, uh, what we find is that what I'm finding is that a lot of them or most of them go back to scuba diving. So hearing intervention, we'll talk about that for a few minutes. And uh, we're at 11.36. So I'll try to wrap this up uh, fairly quickly and see if we have time for uh, questions. I do see a chat question. Um, oh, okay. So the question is about uh, lateral canal fistula. Um, it's a really good question. Um, so, so if you have a, let me, I, oh, we can talk about it now. So the, the classic uh, description or the, the classic recommendation is uh, canal wall down surgery. This is with the lateral canal fistula. If you know it going in. So typically these people will come in, they'll have vertigo, um, and then on your CAT scan, you can, you can see a lateral canal fistula. So the classic board kind of question and board answer kind of question is you do canal wall down surgery, you leave the matrix in place, and that's uh, the treatment. Uh, but uh, a lot of us, uh, what we'll do is we'll suspect a fistula, going in and then as you're dissecting the clostitoma, when you're in the area of the lateral canal, there comes, a, there comes a point where you say, do they have a fistula or they don't have a fistula? And you're over the lateral canal and you lift up the clostitoma, and let's just say you find a small fistula. And then, but you've already now opened the fistula. That's kind of what, what happens a lot of times in clostitoma surgery. So at that point in time, um, uh, remove the matrix, uh, uh, leave canal well up, and then um, uh, make sure that you patch the fistula. I use a large piece of temporalis fascia and then pack that area. But uh, these people will have vertigo post-op. You have to understand this is, this doesn't necessarily mean they'll have um, uh, central, or they prob there's a good chance of central hearing loss. It's not automatic. Uh, but they're almost all the ones that I can think of have vertigo, but that does resolve with some, with some uh, rest and some recovery. So I hope that answers the question, Jeffrey. Um, it's, uh, but I, as from, as a, from a resident perspective, I would still think about your classic uh, canal wall down with leaving the matrix. Okay, so let's talk about hearing. Um, so, I'm a huge fan of uh, cartilage. So I found that cartilage is uh, one of the most amazing otologic materials there is. So, you know, what I'm gonna do in a lot of these cases is I'm gonna work, first of all, uh, to remove the incus. I'm gonna remove the head of the malleus. I wrote a paper about removing the entire malleus and uh, presented that at the academy a few years ago. 
and I found that my hearing results were the same as published hearing results with the malleus in place. But the classic description is to leave the long handle of the malleus in place, uh, remove the head of the malleus, and then with reconstruction, after you have everything removed, um, titanium seems to give really good results in the paper that I published. Uh, we actually found titanium did better than hydroxyapatite, although we have both acicular um, prostheses uh, available. Um, but most of these people are gonna have cartilage. And I'm finding that uh, over the years of using this on, I don't know how many hundreds now, but um, that they heal tremendously well, especially if you use perichondrium as a graft. So if I use tragal, my favorite is tragal cartilage uh, with perichondrium, or I remove the perichondrium, but use the cartilage and then graft with the perichondrium as well. I've had my best results with these in these situations. And then we'd be using titanium implants in those situations, uh, a PORP or a TORP, depending upon what the situation is. So um, uh, in conclusion, um, I hope that um, I haven't been confusing, but uh, uh, I, I wanted to hit on a couple of key points about uh, acquired cholesteatoma, that there is primary acquired cholesteatoma, as we've discussed in the most the classic description, but also to think about secondary acquired cholesteatoma, secondary to some event. So um, if somebody says to me, you have a case of primary acquired cholesteatoma and you have uh, more cholesteatoma later. Um, is that recurrent or is that residual? Now, I'm a, my belief is that for the most part, that's residual. So that uh, when we look at myself <clears throat> doing cholesteatoma surgery, I try to explain to patients that I have about 30% <clears throat> uh, chance that there will still be something left. Even in the best of operations, I'm saying to people about 30% will still have cholesterol in there. That is not really secondary acquired cholesterol. That's still the same process of the primary acquired cholesterol. Patient comes in with a perforation, and you look at the edges of the perforation, and they have rolled edges with squamous epithelium rolling around the side and then entering the middle ear cavity and forming pearls, perhaps but this could be carried in debris throughout, scattered throughout the middle ear. That's your classic secondary acquired cholesterol. Uh, different things, different ways that they behave, but I just wanted to be clear about those uh, descriptions. Um, <clears throat> cholesterol is, is locally invasive and locally destructive. Uh, so structures that are nearby can be injured. And then the definitive treatment is, um, <coughs> excuse me, is going to be a surgical approach. Um, so now let me just summarize uh, one last conclusion about second stages. So I, I do perform second look, second stage operations. I try to individualize these cases. So if I have a patient that comes in with a fairly extensive primary acquired cholesterol that I would say to them, uh, we'll do the surgery and then I will talk to them afterwards I think we're gonna to need to do a second stage. The patients uh, will typically say, okay, what, whatever you say, but I will also talk to them about diffusion weighted MRI scans. So then when I look at, when I look at the post-op, like recovery, uh, if I'm seeing a patient six months post-op and it looks fantastic and their ear, their hearing is decent, I'll probably do a diffusion weighted MRI scan. If I look into their ear and I'm seeing, oh, well, there's obviously more cholesterol there, then I'm going to do a second stage. So I hope that helps in terms of those are kind of two ends of the spectrum. Now, everything in between uh, does require some, um, some ingenuity in terms of like, well, which, what are you going to, you know, are you going to do the MRI? Are you going to do both? Are you going to just operate? Or um, I think that you have to individualize these cases and determine you know, what your approach is going to be. All right, so I'm at uh, 11, let's see what time it is. Uh, we're at 1144. So I think this is a good time to stop. And then um, if there's anybody who wants to write questions, that's fine. Or um, 
turn on their microphone and ask questions, that's good as well. But uh, I wish all of you the very best and um, as we deal with the current situation. But uh, I'm here to take questions um, uh, if you have them. But thank you for your attention.